Good morning and welcome to ECG Part 3. This is the third and final ECG presentation in our series. If you have watched ECG Part 1 and 2, you will see a study progression from basic to more complex. If you hadn't had a chance to watch Parts 1 and 2 yet, they are on the uh, SWARP website, so go ahead and, and upload those uh, for your personal viewing or your personal pleasure. As usual, if you would like to ask a question or if you have a microphone, please select the hand icon and we will unmute you to ask your question. You can also type in your question and we will address them as soon as we can. Please make sure to send your name to us if you're watching in a group so that we can give you credit for attending. This presentation will be taught by Dr. Matt Davis, the Medical Director of Education, Christine Hardy, one of our regional pro program educators, and myself, Justine Jewell, the CBRD Specialist and Interim Education Coordinator. So welcome to ECG Part 3. Thank you, Justine. Uh, the goals of this webinar are to gain familiarity with ver various cardiac conditions that may present in the pre-hospital setting. Um, and hopefully we can generate some interest in advanced concepts and associate them with your paramedic practice. So we have some objectives to meet as well. Um, we'd like to demonstrate an ability to recognize pacemaker rhythms, recognize the purpose of an ICD and how it affects your patient care during cardiac arrest, identify some conditions associated with cardiac, sudden cardiac death, and relate all of this knowledge gained from our case studies today and our investigations to your pre-hospital care. So we will be begin this webinar today with a case study. So case study number one, you have a 59-year-old male on a couch. His wife states that they were watching TV when the patient let out a moan and then became unresponsive. She states he has a bad heart and had a device put in his chest a few years ago that shocks his heart. His past medical history is previous cardiac arrest as well as he has some medications in the bathroom but they're unaware of them, what they are at this point in time. So upon physical exam, his airway is patent. No visible chest rise and fall, no pulses. Uh, he's generally cool, clammy, diaphoretic, and this is the strip that you have in front of you. So we will come back to this case study after a few uh, slides. So a device put in his chest a few years ago. Uh, there's one of two options here. We have a pacemaker and ICD. So the logical assumption is that the patient had a pacemaker or ICD implanted as a result of his cardiac arrest. So we'll just discuss pacemaker and ICDs. So the basics of your pacemaker, it provides electrical stimuli to cause cardiac contraction when intrinsic cardiac activity is inappropriately slow or absent. Uh, it's also used in end-stage heart failure to synchronize ventricular contraction, uh, biventricular pacing, uh, is LV pace synchronized with the right ventricle, um, which reduces the cure restoration and thereby reduced intraventricular or intraventricular asynchrony. Your ICD basics, they're designed to treat tachydysrhythmias, uh, perform cardioversion defibrillation when the ventricular rate exceeds the programmed cutoff rate. Uh, it's also ATP or anti-tachycardia pacing that can be programmed to perform overdrive pacing in an attempt to terminate ventricular tachycardias. Most have pacemaker function and defibrilla uh, defibrillation uh, capabilities as well. So your pulse generators are generally found in the upper chest. Uh, if it's an older ICD, it may be found in the upper abdomen as well. Uh, placed usually subcutaneously or submuscularly. It's connected to the leads that go into the heart uh, and it has is battery operated. So uh, there are some that show uh, batteries of a five to eight year span or up to a 10 year span. The output of the voltage decreases gradually so it makes a sudden battery failure unlikely. Pacemaker nomenclature. This is a pretty busy slide but I just want to outline uh, what you're looking at when you're looking at the name of a pacemaker. So there is five different areas that, that can uh, be named, I guess, uh, for pacemakers. So the position one, or the, the first letter that you're looking at, is the chamber that is paced. So is it atrial, ventricular? A is atrial, V is ventricular, and D is dual. So you have your A and V that are paced. 
Uh, your second one refers to the chamber that sense, so it refers to the location where the pacemaker senses nati native cardiac electrical activity. Again, you have A, B, or D. Uh, your third position refers to the pacemaker's response to sense native cardiac activity. So your T or I is what you're looking at, as well as D. So T is sensed activity results in triggering, triggering of pace activity, and I is sensed activity results in inhibition of pace activity. Your fourth and fifth position are a little bit more rare. You don't see that name very often, but the fourth position is your rate modulation. So it indicates the ability for the rate um, designed to, to uh, alter the heart rate appropriately to meet physiological needs of that patient. Uh, and then your fifth position is your multi-site pacing. So it allows the indication of multiple simulation sites with an anatomical area. So that just gives you a very uh, basic level of, of how pacemakers are named. And in the pre-hospital setting, the, the whole names, the, the AI, AAI, VVI, DDD, really doesn't matter. Again, once the patient comes to the emergency department, there's a bit more information that uh, physicians can use to help troubleshoot some of the problems that they have with the, the pacemakers themselves, as well as, as interpreting some of the more complex ECGs. So the most common pacing modes are AAI, VV1, and DDD, and most patients are managed with one of the three most common modes. So it's also important to note that you'll see here that there are spikes shown in, in the examples that we're giving you, but the most recent pacing makers, the newest ones, you may not see a spike on your ECG. So for your AAI, it's atrial pacing and sensing. So and your VV1, ventricular pacing and sensing, and DDD is capable of pacing both the atria and the ventricle. So if you look at the first one, AAI, you'll notice you have a spike and then a P wave leading into your QRS. With your VV, VVI, you have your spike and then your QRS complex, so you're, that's, that is generating uh, impulse into the ventricles. And your DDD, you have a spike before your P wave and before your QRS complex. So just what the pacemaker is doing during each of these um, rhythms. Um, we'll start here. You have your QRS, your T wave. Then the, the hearts or the pacemaker is waiting for that P wave to come again. So it waits, waits, waits. Doesn't sense a P wave. Therefore, it fires and a P wave is generated. This, this P wave is then conducted through the AV node and you get your QRS complex. Similar with the VVI. Um, what happens is you have your QRS, your T wave, has a P wave, and then the pacemaker is waiting to sense, uh, to see if there is a QRS. It doesn't sense a QRS, fires, you get your electrical conduction and your QRS complex. And pretty much the DDD is just a combination of the two. You have your QRS, your T wave. The pacemaker waits for that, uh, sensing the P wave, does not sense a P wave, so fires, you get your P wave. Again, it waits to sense for a QRS, does not sense the QRS, fires, and you get your QRS complex. So this brings us to our first poll question. So just have a look at this rhythm strip here carefully, and then our, we'll give you a couple of seconds to look at it, and then we'll populate our poll question here. So just to get you thinking about what this rhythm is, the rhythm indicates what type of pacemaker. So A, AAI, B, VVI, D, DDD, and D, ABC. So we see that majority of you have selected DDD. That's great. That is exactly it. So you have been paying attention. Good job. So common indications for the need of a pacemaker. So patients with sick sinus syndrome, or also known as tachybrady syndrome, 
symptomatic bradycardias, AFib with a slow ventricular response, third degree heart blocks, and prolonged QT syndrome. Uh, there's two general factors that guide the decision of implant and pacemaker, and that's the association of symptoms with an arrhythmia and the location of the conduction abnormality. Indications for an ICD. ICD implantation is generally considered the first-line treatment option for the prevention of sudden cardiac death in high-risk patients. So there's some complications associated with uh, ICD and pacemakers. Uh, one is uh, operative failure, so that's either, either over-sensing or under-sensing. Um, inappropriate cardioversion with your ICDs or defibrillation, so an overfiring or underfiring, uh, inappropriate energy output based on the rhythm that's presented, and uh, again, under sensing, so the ability to, to sense the underlying rhythm and put out enough of a stimulus to create that uh, heartbeat. And uh, device deactivation, so either through battery failure or wires become uh, detached. So generally, uh, ICDs are, have a, uh, an amount of joules. So when we defibrillate people, we, we put an amount of joules externally. Internally, um, it can be up to 40 joules that is applied directly within the heart and those wires that are there. So ICD failure to delivery or ineffective cardioversion. So the management for you is um, external pacing, defibrillation, or cardioversion. So um, do not withhold any therapy for fear of damaging the ICD. Uh, even if you come upon a person and you see that that spike, that energy has been delivered, you're still going to continue on with the same therapy that you normally do. Uh, if the patient's internal defibrillator uh, activates during chest compressions, you may feel a little bit of mild tinkling within your fingers, but there has been no significant adverse effects related to this. Uh, in any healthcare provider. Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about uh, providing CPR to someone who has an ICD in there. There is a, a bit of a movement too amongst uh, some emergency physicians to do some continuous chest compressions during uh, external defibrillation and you know some people do get a little bit of sensation in the hands with that so wouldn't expect you to feel too much if the ICD were to go off and you are doing CPR on that patient. So this is a possibility of what you may see if, uh, if the ICD is not uh, firing enough energy or there's been uh, battery failure. So you may see it try to output energy, but your uh, patient may not convert out of the rhythm. So if you're running your rhythm strips, these are just different levels of rhythm strips. You may see that fire, but again, you're still going to treat the patient the same. There isn't, there isn't any difference in your care. So back to our patient. Um, it leads us to our next poll question. So what was the device uh, in the patient's chest that the wife was referring to? So A, pacemaker, B, coronary artery stent, C, ICD, or D, mechanical aortic valve. We'll give you a couple, minutes, or a couple seconds to answer that. So just waiting for the results here. So good, we have a little bit of a split decision here. Some of you said pacemaker, some of you said ICD. So the reason why an ICD may have been placed over top of a pacemaker, you may have had both, the ICD with pacemaker function, is due to his risk factors of having a previous cardiac arrest. You see by his rhythm here, he is in a, in a V-fib rhythm, so our treatment would be the same as we would treat any cardiac arrest patients at this point in time. Okay, so we would treat this patient using our ALS directives, which includes CPR, defibrillation is warranted. Um, avoid pad placement over the pulse generator if possible. Um, obviously, your airway and ventilation management and IV and medications um, if they're available to you. This um, question was brought up in an Ask Mac uh, question previously, so we thought that um, we would directly 
discuss this case here in ECG webinar 3. So we do know that these things, uh, medics are seeing this in the field, and we hope that by uh, discussing this case study here today that we are um, telling you we're acknowledging what you're asking and the things you're seeing on, on, in the field. So at the bottom here you can see the advanced life support patient care standards, medical directives should apply to all of these patients with an ICD placement. So that was a, a very, you know, skim of the surface review on ICDs and pacemakers. You could have a whole, you know, two-hour webinar about, well, an hour on pacemakers, an hour on ICDs, but that's just kind of an introduction to some pacemaker, some rhythms that you may see in the pre-hospital setting as well as some patients you may encounter who do have ICDs. So now we're moving on to sudden cardiac death syndromes, and we'll review uh, many different cases with you as we go through this. But just to give you some statistics here, worldwide there's 3 million incidences, uh, survival is low, in the U.S. 450,000 and around Europe 400,000. There was a study done this year um, looking at cases in Ontario. So uh, the this data was pulled from 2008. and in Ontario, we had 174 cases of sudden cardiac death. Uh, structural heart disease was present in 126 cases, so that's 72%, and 78% of those structural heart diseases was unrecognized. So there was no, identif uh, no identifiable cause in 48 cases, so that's 28%, and that represents primary arrhythmia syndromes in this patient population. So the, uh, this was done by the uh, University of Western Ontario, and it was a retro retrospective study. So can, the incidence of sudden cardiac death increases with age, typically occurring in men at rest at home with unrecognized underlying heart disease or primary arrhythmia syndrome. And prevention strategies should consider targeting identification of unrecognized structural heart disease and primary uh, arrhythmia syndrome recognition. So we will be presenting three case studies and discuss syndromes associated with sudden cardiac death. So this case study, this case study is a syncope case study. The paramedics presented to emerge with a 50-year-old female. Her chief complaint was syncope. Um, the incident history includes the patient had been experiencing uh, episodes of sudden shaking and sweating, followed by lapses in consciousness. She reported recent use of heroin and cocaine use to the paramedics. Her past medical history includes IV drug use and HIV infection. Um, she is on methadone uh, for her heroin addiction and takes a series of HIV medications as well as some anti-anxiety and some medications for sleep. So take a look at this presenting rhythm. This is what the paramedics had on their um, screen. And see if you notice anything unusual. What's most noticeable in this ECG is this strange occurrence here uh, with red circles. So it appears as if something is not normal there. Um, we're going to ask our next poll question here. So what is a normal QT interval? A, depends on the heart rate. B, less than 600 milliseconds, 0 0.600 milliseconds. C, depends on the sex of the individual. Or D, what is a QT interval? We'll just wait a couple more seconds for some people to answer. Okay, so um, A is um, <clears throat> partially correct. The QT interval is dependent on the heart rate, but it's also dependent on gender. There is a set normal. Um, less than 0 0.600 milliseconds is um, partially correct as well, and we'll discuss that in a minute. The actual correct answer is it depends on the sex of the individual. I thought more people would be asking what is a QT interval, um, but I'm going to explain it anyway. So exactly what is a QT interval? And uh, it's a measure of time between the start of a Q wave and the end of a T wave. 
So you can see here with the arrows that that's how it's measured. That's all. So this interval, you can, sorry, you can see this one's out of place. It's supposed to be over there. The QT interval represents electrical depolarization and repolarization of the ventricles. So measuring the QT interval using lead 2, which is the strip we looked at uh, previously, um, is virtually impossible um, because the QT interval is based on what the patient's heart rate is on your ECG strip. So, so a slow heart rate will produce a prolonged QT uh, rate interval and a fast heart rate will produce a shortened QT interval. So if we were to attempt to measure this in the field just using a lead to ECG, um, we wouldn't be able to correct for the heart rate factor. Um, if you wanted to, you could use one of these formulas in the chart. Um, however, that's something we wouldn't be doing in the field. Um, a 12 lead tracing, however, can produce an accurate QT, um, QT reading interval measurement. So you can see here um, on this tracing that when you get your 12 lead printout, you can see that it accounts for the QT interval and QTC. So the QTC interval is the corrected measurement and the actual, um, using the formula, and the actual interval uh, that the patient's presenting with. So a QTC is prolonged if it's greater than 440 milliseconds in men or greater than 460 milliseconds in women. Uh, greater than 500 milliseconds is associated with an increased risk of torsades. QTC is, nor is abnormally short if it's less than 350 milliseconds. Also, a useful rule of thumb uh, when looking at your ECG strips is that a normal QT is less than half the preceding RR interval. From an emergency department's perspective, uh, again, we just look at the, the computer-generated algorithm as to the QTC for, for calculating the QT interval. Um, computers do a great job of calculating if they're accurate, so that is one of the, the reliable interpretations of the, the ECG algorithm. So back to our patient who presented in that um, initial rhythm strip to the paramedics. During his evaluation in eMERGE, this uh, patient suddenly lost consciousness, and the rhythm that was revealed um, was a polymorphic tachycardia, or torsades. So um, this brings us to our next poll question. So examine this rhythm. The question here is if this patient with this rhythm presented to you in the field who are uh, unstable, however perfusing, what is the most appropriate treatment for her or him? A, cardioversion, B, lidocaine, C, amiodarone, or D, BLS care including uh, IV uh, and with a bolus if she's hypotensive. So we'll just wait a couple minutes. So this patient is perfusing, has a pulse, and is presenting unstable. Okay, so our answer is 73% um, said cardioversion, zero lidocaine, a couple amiodarone, and BLS care, including an IV. Um, the most appropriate answer in this situation would be BLS care, including an IV. Um, speaking to cardioversion, um, I'll let Matt address uh, calling for cardioversion or uh, medication in this patient. So with this rhythm, it is uh, it's known as torsades de point. Um, meaning it's a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. As you can see, there's, there's all uh, kind of a swinging of the axis. So you get some of your larger QRS morphology and your shorter, Q, or shorter QRS morphology. This patient has a pulse. They're unstable, but has a pulse. The thing about uh, torsades is it's often paroxysmal, so they'll go into it and come out spontaneously. Uh, with cardioversion or, or 
you can cardiovert these patients, but again, it is just a temporary fix. They're more they're likely to go back into it again. Um, lidocaine again really doesn't have much an effect with these rhythms. Um, it may terminate it shortly, but they'll just go back into it again uh, within minutes usually. The treatments for this um, are usually undertaking the emergency department, um, and the biggest treatments for this is giving them magnesium sulfate, giving them overdrive pacing or increasing their heart rate to reduce their QT interval or using medications to increase their heart rate. By increasing their heart rate, you decrease the QT interval, preventing this type of rhythm. Now if this patient were not to have a pulse and present in this rhythm, then yes, you would defibrillate this patient and treat it as a ventricular tachycardia without a pulse. So it wouldn't be inappropriate to patch to a physician in this case. Um, however, continuing your BLS care, establishing an IV and transporting is very important. Um, if you were to re receive a um, cardioversion order, you may struggle with capture um, an appropriate cardioversion in this case. So that's exactly what, what Matt just spoke to. Uh, the treatment that occurred for this patient um, in eMERGE was mag sulfate 2 grams IV. It eventually converted this uh, patient to this rhythm. Um, however, this patient uh, continued to experience several more episodes of torsades, uh, despite medication changes, which included decreasing the methadone. Uh, they temporarily paced, there was an electrolyte correction, and they did attempt to um, cardiovert at one point. Eventually, this patient was, um, again, decreased their methadone, and the patient was sent and implanted a dual chamber cardioverter defibrillator. Um, after all of this, the reduction of the patient's methadone and um, the patient was discharged. So I'm just going to jump in. There's a couple of questions from the audience here. Uh, the first question regarding um, ICDs and pacemakers. And the question was, is there a way to determine the difference um, based on your physical exam? as to whether or not a patient has a pacemaker or an ICD implanted if they themselves don't have that information. Um, for instance, you know, if it's on the left versus the right, the size of it. Unfortunately, there's, there's no way to determine based on the physical exam itself. You can always ask the patient or a patient's family member for the card that they are supposed to carry in their wallet. Often patient, oftentimes, patients with pacemakers will carry a card which states the, the type of pacemaker they have, such as an AAI, a BVI, or if they have an ICD. So you can always ask the patient if they have the, the card in their wallet. Um, another question came in about uh, the difference between men and women and why uh, they have a different um, QT length, why women is, is shorter than men. And the reason for that is um, on a population basis, women tend to have slower heart rates than men and therefore a, a shorter QT interval. So that's the, the difference there just based on population studies, the, the norm the, between, or the, sorry, the difference between men and women, why those, those uh, QT intervals are different. Okay, so how does this affect our field treatment? Um, for us, uh, getting an accurate history of incidents, uh, family history, or history of other related events is extremely important, or any strange findings, uh, strange ECG um, things you see, bring in and sh share with the physicians. Um, let's talk a minute, though, about why we're doing pre-hospital 12 leads. Originally, we were doing 12 lead ECGs to shorten our time to uh, reperfusion for patients presenting with STEMI. Um, however, uh, based on Ask Mac, um, we are encouraging that if you feel that there is a, a reason to do a 12 lead uh, ECG in the field and it's not going to delay patient transport, that that's reasonable as long as it's done in a in a in a, t a time frame that's appropriate and the patient is hemodynamically unstable. Uh, there is not an exhaustive list of all the clinical situations this should be um, occurring. However. Considering a 12 lead is reasonable in um, stable patients. So carrying on with prolonged QT discussion, um, patients with long QT syndrome, it, they don't necessarily have a prolonged QT at all times. So example, um, some patients may develop it with um, exercise. Um, discussing congenital long QT syndrome, I'll pass that to Matt. 
there's a there's a couple of genetic mutations out there um, which predispose people to have a, a prolonged QT. Um, you know, it's usually discovered in, in childhood or early adulthood. Um, it usually runs in family, and there's a couple of different syndromes. Um, so again, these patients, uh, it's congenital, they're born with this and often pick up quite early in their life, uh, unfortunately. Sometimes it's not picked up and these patients do die of sudden cardiac death. So other things that cause a prolonged QT uh, medications? Um, so the, there's a group of, when you think of uh, long QT syndrome, think of the anti-medication. So classes of, of medications that cause prolonged QT, so certain antibiotics, certain antidepressants, certain antipsychotics, as well as the hypo, so your hypokalemia, hypomagnesium, um, hypothermia, hypothyroid, those are kind of the most common causes of, of acquired prolonged QTs, as well as uh, patients who are suffering from MI or increased intracranial pressure and sometimes also have a prolonged QT. Yeah, the symptoms are obviously syncope, seizures, and sudden death. And although prolonged QT syndrome will not be diagnosed or possibly even identified in the field, it can be associated with sudden cardiac death. So now we'll tr transition into another poll question. So a useful rule of thumb is that a normal QT interval is A, greater than 500 milliseconds, B, less than 350 milliseconds, C, less than half the preceding RR interval, or D, only determined by performing a 12 lead. So we'll give you a couple minutes. Okay, so just get your answers in, and excellent. So we have corrected ans answered that correctly. 75% of people said less than half, less than half of the preceding R interval, and that is accurate. Do we have any questions we want to address before moving on to the next case study? So one question came in asking about uh, if you're a BLS paramedic, whether or not calling for ALS uh, backup for a patient who has the polymorphic VT. Um, with, a, with a pulse. And again, the treatment for this patient is early transport to hospital. Again, the, the treatments for this patient uh, are, are best delivered in the emergency department. So in that case, the, 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 the best treatment for this patient is to, to load and go. Okay, don't forget that you can raise your hand at any time and um, speak directly to us through the webinar and generate some discussion, that's okay too. Continue typing in your questions as well, we appreciate those. So moving on to our third case study. So you're called to a residence for a 36-year-old 30, male, VSA at 2 a.m. No significant past medical history. His wife states she heard her husband cry out in his sleep and then started shaking in the bed. She called 911 when he would not respond to her and then started CPR. So when you got there, you hooked the patient up to the monitor and you see this, oh, bad sign. Uh, first shock was delivered and then the patient became asystolic. So then the ACP crew arrives, three rounds of epi were given and then they called for a pronouncement. So this is uh, an example of your typical unrecognized Brigada syndrome. It's characterized by uh, ECG findings of a right bundle branch block-like pattern and persistent uh, ST elevation in V1 through V3. Uh, these pe people normally have uh, structurally normal hearts um, and there's a propensity for life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. They also have J-point elevation and we'll look at a few um, ECGs as we go. So it's re also related to abnormal sodium ion channels in myocytes. 50% are uh, spontaneous mutations and there's over 60 different mutations that cause Brigada syndrome. So here we see some uh, different, different rhythm strips in various leads and this is what's, uh, what's referred to as a Brugada syndrome. So it's a right bundle branch like pattern and again it's kind of the are our prime or the rabbit ears that are seen in the right bundle branch block. But you'll notice here V1 through V3 there's some ST elevation and this is kind of the characteristic ST elevation that is seen 
with type 1 Brugada syndrome. Again, the arrow is pointing to those abnormal uh, ST segments. Again, another ECG, and this is the, the type 1 Brugada syndrome. Again, it's the right bundle branch-like pattern, that RR prime, or those rabbit ears in your V1, V2 leads. But again, you'll notice that uh, unusual-looking ST segment where you do get this uh, cove type of pattern of ST elevation in V1 through V3. So the thing about Brugada syndrome is really you don't have any symptoms of this, unfortunately, until you go into a VTAC or V-fib arrest. So these patients often present, unfortunately, with an unexpected sudden cardiac death. Um, they may have a, a previous history of syncope or what's thought of as, as to be in seizures, and those seizures are actually them going into uh, VF or VFib and spontaneously reverting out of it. So oftentimes uh, patients will, will present with uh, uh, chronic type of movements, gasping for air, and in fact they're not actually, well they're seizing, the reason why they're seizing is because they're not perfusing their brain because they are in VFib or VTAC arrest. Oftentimes um, they'll have these events at night, um, and it's just thought to be thrashing around related to nightmares, but they'll have unusual breathing patterns. And again, this is kind of the paroxysmal, pulseless uh, VTAC, VFib that they go into. Affects men more than women with an 8 to 1 ratio, and cases are reported worldwide. It's classically kind of reported in the Southeast Asian uh, population, um, where the highest incidence is. Um, the mean age of death is about 40 years of age, but again, it can happen anywhere from you know, the case reports from day, age day 2 to age 84. Um, so now that it's the, the holiday season and you're, you're going to be at your Christmas party, here's a little bit of, of trivial information that you can use. Because it's reported um, so highly in Southeast Asia, um, and it actually before it was discovered, it was only discovered this Brugada syndrome um, early 1990s, but in Southeast Asia, kind of the Northeast area and the Lao area, they've known about this for centuries because it has run through families. And the thought, the cure or treatment for this was thought to be to get married early because it affects males more than women. So men would often get married because these symptoms would happen at night. They thought they would be safe by having someone in bed with them to, to save them from the, these night terrors that often cause people to die. Another uh, interesting fact is because it affected men more than women, in these areas oftentimes the men would, would go to bed dressed up as women thinking that death would pass them by because they were a woman and not a man. So a little bit of trivial information for you at your holiday parties. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Matt. <laughs> so again here, there's three types of Brugada syndrome. The most kind of important one is this type 1, which the, the examples have been. There's two other types of patterns of Brugada syndrome. Um, less common, again, not quite as convincing when we do see them on ECG findings that they truly have um, a Brugada syndrome that will lead to, to sudden cardiac death. But usually the, the type 1s are the ones that we get most worried about. But again, any patient who presents with these type 2 or type 3s uh, in the emergency department will get a referral on to electrophysiologists for further workup of Brugada syndrome. So how is it diagnosed? Again, patients with uh, syncope um, or these events of night terrors at, at night uh, and a family history of, of um, Brugada syndrome will get uh, kind of worked up a bit more. The physical exam, again, there's no physical findings, so it's a normal physical exam. Again, anyone who presents with, with syncope, the question we always ask in the emergency department, is there a family history of, of a sudden cardiac death? And that's kind of someone who's died in their early 20s or early 30s uh, or teenage years without any known uh, cause. Again, ECG, it's our best screening tool, and we've gone through those examples there. Um, it's not diagnostic, but again, these patients will get uh, referred to uh, cardiology or electrophysiology for further workup especially if there's a concerning story such as syncope come into the emergency department and they are found to have these ECG findings. Again, imaging tests of so doing a cath or a stress test or a, um, a cardiac MRI, these don't show anything because there's no underlying structural disease within the coronary arteries. This is a sodium channel 
uh, blocker uh, receptor, um, sorry, a sodium channel receptor uh, mutation, which causes these patients to go into a sudden VTAC and VFib. So again, none of those tests that we have available in the emergency department are, are diagnostic of Brugada syndrome. So how is it diagnosed? Again, they have the ECG, which uh, is in keeping with Brugada syndrome, and then they'll go on to EP, um, and if they're able to induce VFib or VTAC um, within the, the EP lab, or if there's a history of VFib or VTAC, they will get an ICD. Um, again, if there's a family history of sudden cardiac death, they'll get an ICD. Um, if family members also have the similar type of ECGs, and this is more indicative of, of Brugada syndrome, uh, and so they will often get an ICD as well. So the treatment for this, again, is the implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Um, patients who, who don't have uh, any history but have a family history of spontaneous cardiac death, uh, they come in with a normal ECG, often uh, get worked up from an uh, EP standpoint. They'll give these patients uh, beta block, or sorry, sodium channel blockers to see if they can induce the um, abnormality seen on the ECG with Brugada syndrome. Again, they'll do EP studies, see if they can um, cause any VFib or VTAC with, with the e electrophysiology studies in these patients, uh, as well as some patients can get genetic testing for Brugada syndrome. Unfortunately, with the genetic testing, as Justine said earlier, there's about 60 different mutations. So the, the yield on that is very low because they can only test for a few of those, of those mutations at this time. So this brings us to our next poll question. So Brugada syndrome is associated with A, sodium channel mutation, B, prolonged QT syndrome, C, left bundle branch block, D, a certain medications. So we have a couple of seconds to answer that question. And pretty much everybody was paying attention. You are correct, uh, sodium channel mutation, as uh, Matt outlined nicely. Good, okay, so unless there's any other questions, I know we're giving you an awful lot of information um, at one time, but if anyone has any questions, again, press the hand icon, icon or type in your question. We'll move on to the next case study. Okay, so I'm not seeing any, so we'll move on to the next case study, which is a call that uh, a lot of us are familiar with. This is a 37-year-old male calling 911, um, complaining of intermittent chest pain over three days. He describes this chest pain as a set of 7 out of 10 on his pain scale, retrosternal radiating down the left arm. He's diaphoretic, has palpitations and dizziness each time these um, chest pain episodes occur. He also reported to EMS that there was no nausea and vomiting associated. He's had two episodes or three episodes in the previous days, and they lasted about 15 minutes apiece. They were relieved with rest. He also had an episode uh, that awoke him from sleep. He has no past medical history. His most recent episode was immediately prior to calling 911 um, today. So pre-hospital care and assessment, obviously oxygen, cardiac monitoring, uh, 12 lead, his vital signs are there in front of you, heart rate, blood pressure, temp, um, all normal. An IV was initiated, TKVO, uh, nitroglycerin was administered, and the patient received ASA. So the 12 lead, the pre-hospital 12 lead ECG is in front of you. This is when the patient was complaining of uh, 5 out of 10 chest pain with the paramedics. Okay, so um, ongoing, patient is taken to the hospital, and arrival at eMERGE, the patient is pain-free, post-medication, um, post-nitro treatment. Take a look at this ECG, and or 12-lead ECG, and examine it carefully. <clears throat> so we're going to ask our next poll question at this time. This is the same ECG. And what do you see on this 12 lead? Do you think it's a normal 12 lead reading or ECG? Do you see a septal STEMI? 
inferior ischemia or abnormal T waves? We'll give you a couple minutes to answer that question. Okay, so just get your answers in. Okay, most people said they see abnormal T waves, 59%, some 6% um, normal, septal, okay. So what you are seeing are abnormal T waves here present in this 12 leaf. Um, again, this is the 12 leaf that was taken when the patient was uh, pain free in the emergency department. And you're seeing uh, biphasic T waves present in leads V1 and V2 and deep um, inverted T waves in V3 and V4. So this is what's known as Wellen syndrome. Um, this is a characteristic T-wave pattern that we see on the ECG uh, and is only seen or usually seen just when the patient is pain-free. And there's two types of Wellen syndrome, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is the, the more common of them, and that's when you see these deep inverted T-waves, uh, kind of V1, V2, V3, sometimes extending to, to V4 and V5, but usually located kind of in the the right sided and, and um, V2, V3 leads. Type 2 is that biphasic similar to what was seen earlier there and that's kind of a, uh, a characteristic pattern which is known as type 2 Wellen syndrome. So the interesting thing with these patients is that um, when they do have pain, oftentimes these ECG abnormalities are not found on, on the ECG. Uh, they'll have what looks like a, a kind of a, a normal, no ST or T wave changes uh, on the ECG. Um, but once you start giving them their symptomatic treatment, giving them the ASA and nitroglycerin, if they, they meet the uh, inclusion criteria for their cardiac ischemia sounding chest pain, um, you know, they are able to uh, perfuse the coronary arteries, they get to the emergency department, they don't have any pain, oftentimes they'll have this characteristic finding ECG. Again, showing you uh, the benefit of the pre-hospital ECG in changing uh, emergency medicine uh, management of these patients because, again, these are dynamic changes. They're having pain. They've got an ECG. You treat them for their pain. They no longer have cardiac ischemic sounding pain. And then they get to the emergency department and they've got these uh, abnormal ECG findings. So that's more evidence that we can use to have these patients seen uh, by cardio cardiology uh, immediately. So what does uh, Wellen syndrome mean? Well, this is indicating that their proximal left anterior descending coronary artery uh, is critically stenosed. Um, and oftentimes, uh, these patients are ticking time bombs. They usually have a stenosis of about 95% or more. Um, I think the mean time before these patients go on to have an MI is about eight days. So these are patients that need to be admitted to the, uh, the cardiology service and often get CATs urgently, not emergently, but usually urgently uh, within uh, you know, 12 to 24 hours. Okay, and this brings us to our next poll question, um, I believe our last poll question. Okay, the left anterior descending coronary artery supplies blood to the A, anterior lateral septum and heart apex, B, the inferior heart, C, posterior heart, or D, right ventricle. So I'll just give you a couple minutes to answer. Okay, so just get your answers in and we'll be closing the polling. And so A is correct. So this uh, LAD occlusion, the, called the widowmaker, this term is used because if the artery becomes abruptly and completely occluded, it can cause a massive anterior wall MI and can lead to sudden death. So as Matt said, um, these patients who present with Wellen syndrome, 75% um, of these patients will develop an acute anterior MI within one week unless uh, intervent intervention is um, undertaken. So back to this patient, what happened to him? Um, the ECG in the hospital was immediately recognized as well in syndrome by the physician. He was admitted to CCU uh, and was catheterized. 
and was uh, discharged home the following day with some additional medications. So in summary, um, obviously there's great importance in obtaining a full and complete incident history and having a high level of suspicion. Our pre-hospital care really does make a difference. I just want to point out as well, um, this was a question asked on Ask Mac. Um, a lot of people have been asking us to look at following up with uh, particular patients or cases that they found interesting. And um, we are unable to actually do that due to privacy legislation and um, things like that. So what we encourage you to do is if you get an interesting call um, or you find uh, a situation that you'd like investigated, uh, email it to your regional educator or your local medical director and we can look into um, adding in webinars or things like that that can enhance your learning. We wouldn't be specifically discussing any particular case as we did not do so today. However, we can um, expand on some of the interesting clinical situations that you encounter. So that was a very quick, I mean, um, <laughs> kind of overview of certain abnormalities found in uh, patients in the pre-hospital setting, um, kind of taking it to the next step, the next level. Again, a lot of this information is nice to know information, not need to know information, but it does take you to that next step to kind of recognize some of these things and what happens to these patients once they, they arrive in the emergency department. Again, it's very hard to do justice to all these topics. We're just kind of skimming the surface on them. Again, as I said earlier, you could probably present an hour on each of these topics. So that was just kind of a, an introduction to some of these more uh, complicated or um, interesting cases that, that are out there. Um, so thank you for everyone who joined in today uh, to take part in this. And hopefully you, you did learn a little bit about uh, some of these, uh, these conditions here. And again, if you, you leave this webinar with your head spinning, that is fine. It's not need to know information. This is just kind of nice to know information and, and taking it to the next level as, as was requested by the paramedics out there in the Southwest. So we have about seven minutes left. Um, again, if you could raise your hand, you can um, speak live um, at the webinar and generate some discussion, ask any questions, make any comments, or again, type um, anything you'd like into the question bar. We just want to uh, readdress the goals and our objectives of this webinar, and it was to uh, generate interest in the advanced concepts and associate them with our practice. I think that we can relate the knowledge gained today from our case studies to our pre-hospital care, keeping in mind that these are advanced concepts, and um, to keep bringing these ideas to us, and, and we can present them in webinar, webinar fashion. So do we have any additional questions coming in? Okay, so we're just getting some feedback uh, through the question um, bar and saying it was great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so I think that wraps us up uh, for today's webinar. We're glad you enjoyed it and feel free to email uh, your local medical director or um, your regional educator. Thank you for attending. <laughs>